Governor Bruce Rauner promised during his budget address that a deal for this budget year was days away. We're still waiting. That's coming up next on Capitol View. And hello, I'm Amanda Vinicky, and I'm glad to be here this week for Capital View with Pat Yeagle of the Illinois Times and Andy Maloney of the Chicago Law Bulletin. We're going to begin our discussion talking about Governor Bruce Rauner, who during his budget address said that it was just days before he was going to come to a deal with the legislative leaders on the fiscal year 15 budget. It ran short of money and that's causing a whole lot of problems for subsidized daycare, court reporters, prison guards, payroll, there's a whole slew of issues, but you know what? It's more than a week since, and we have heard nothing. In fact, Senate President John Cullerton's office says there's a major divide remaining. Let's get to it. First of all, Andy Maloney, um, can you speak to some of the problems that the budget gap has presented, and why is there a budget gap? We're in February. The fiscal year doesn't end until the end of June, so why, why do we have a problem in the first place? Well, this is something that the legislators, I, I think, alluded to even last session um, and maybe some others, but we obviously had the rollback of the income tax, which uh, caused some some shortfalls and there was this assumption that perhaps we would get uh, some kind of income tax or other uh, uh, increase in revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, that didn't happen no before mm -hmm. the end of the session and it still hasn't happened. Uh, so now what we're looking at is about 1.6 billion, I believe that's short, like you said, child care, uh, court reporters and prisons. Um, for court reporters, for example, uh, a big issue there, it's, it's a, a job or a description that a lot of people probably don't know about outside of the legal system, but... And who cares? Uh, really? I mean, court uh, reporters, things right. we could do, do without? And even uh, with a s comparatively small chunk of the budget going toward the court reporters, this still matters for a lot of people because uh, I, I think it was the uh, uh, chief, uh, conference of chief judges, the head of the conference of chief judges said, this basically amounts to a de facto closure of a lot of courts. You talk about like felony trials, some of the most serious cases require statutorily that you have a record of all the transcripts that go on. Which the court makes reporters, sense, right? The court <laughs> reporters are the ones who provide the transcripts. Now, there don't, don't need to be official transcripts in every single case. There are some Nonviolent, maybe some misdemeanor cases, also civil that don't require that. Put your but, iPhone up there. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, but when you're talking about some of the more serious cases, obviously you, you need the transcript without court reporters. If they don't get the money uh, by, I believe, the end of March, March 31st, then you've got a lot of uh, circuit courts that are going to have to make some decisions on whether they can proceed in those trials, whether they can find some money to stretch out their resources, or whether they have to uh, delay those types of cases. So in a way, when Governor Rauner took over, he had a heap of problems in his lap from the onset. Part of it, I guess you could say he'd almost asked for because the governor had asked the General Assembly to hold off making any big decisions. Not that there was a major appetite to give a Republican governor who had advocated for rolling back an income tax increase the increase so he'd have a bunch of money to play with. Regardless, he, he'd said, wait. Um, but time has continued, he said, right away. I mean, even before he became governor, during the transition, we were aware this was going to be an issue. And then, as I said, Pat, during his budget address, he said, literally days away. And that was a comment that, frankly, was echoed by the Democratic Speaker of the Illinois House, Michael Madigan, who said, yeah, I, th I think that's about right. So what gives? Uh Honestly, I'm not sure you never know really what's going on in Mike Madigan's head, of course. And um, I think a lot of the, um, the rhetoric from Rounders Camp, of course, is, is just rhetoric um, because he's, you know, he's a newcomer. But um, I think at the crux of it is just that um, the, the State House Democrats, you know, and the Senate and um, House um, basically look at it as, you know, you came in and decided you were going to be the savior, so save us, you know. 
make you make the first move, decide what you're going to do, and you know we'll let you take the heat for it. You know, wear the jacket just like he said he was going to do. Well, and it seems as if he's willing. I mean, the the governor is asking, from what we understand, these are all closed door negotiations. But mm -hmm. Rauner is asking for basically extraordinary powers to manage the budget as he sees fit. He says that there are some expenses Illinois is covering right now that are non-essential. He wants to move that into essential services like court reporters paying to keep prison guards and also this state subsidized daycare program for low income families. And yet, my confusion, <laughs> and it really is because he came out of a meeting with his cabinet and the governor said, yep, we're working on it. I'm working on it. Blast from the past of Governor Pat Quinn phrase 24 seven. And yet, you heard, I mean, I right after hearing Rauner say that, was like, oh, maybe something happened. Called the Senate President's office because he last weekend had given an interview to Reuters and said, no, this is going to be difficult, particularly because his budget address laid out so many cuts. Yeah. Democrats don't like that, that it was going to be really difficult for Democrats to be able to stomach giving the governor power to do cuts right away. Right. So why? <laughs> If Rauner ostensibly is aware that Collerton isn't on board because either they've met or I've heard they haven't actually even really met that much about it, why would he say that they're close? What, 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 why would he say that when they're apparently not, at least from one side, that he would need the support of? Yeah. It seems like maybe his um, mouth got ahead of his brain or, you know, <laughs> I mean, that I definitely know time. what that is like, <laughs> but I can relate, yeah. And it could be also a function of um, I mean, we saw this right after uh, 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 Rauner was elected. He mm -hmm. said, I, I've spoken, I've gotten my message to the Speaker and the, and the Senate President, and then you come back to them a day later and they're like, no, you didn't. You know, no, you, you didn't. You, right, you, it was like you, his it was, big public speech. Right, and, I called and, him. And <laughs> it was more along the lines of surrogates for mm -hmm. the governor-elect, called surrogates for the House Speaker and the Senate President. And it's possible that, as you said, since these are closed door nature, uh, there's communications going back and forth between all of those parties, and perhaps the message is sort of getting lost in, uh, in translation almost. Uh, but I think Pat maybe mentioned it too at the beginning. This is a, you know, he's, he's new in the, in the office. Uh, I think has an interest, perhaps more than the Senate president and the speaker, of uh, making it look like and, and even wanting to believe that things are going better behind mm -hmm. the scenes than than they really are or that the those other two uh, uh, think that they are right perhaps it's either public posturing mm -hmm. or he is trying to not accumulate any ill will with the democratic leaders mm -hmm. and therefore yeah things are going fine and, and i don't yeah. know if that's working right. <laughs> and certainly there uh, there's a possibility too that this isn't only about this particular budget hole. Right. Uh, it's about future budgets. It's about future legislation. I think with the Senate president being more pointed and, and more um, uh, willing to say that th there's not a deal imminent could be sort of setting the tone for future negotiations in situations like this, saying we're not just going to follow in lockstep even when we're in this hole. Um, we're going to do what we can to get what we want, what we think is right, and you're not going to trample all over us. I was speaking with a legislator who said it seems as if he hasn't gotten the memo yet that being governor is not like being a boss. You can't just tell <laughs> us what to do. We legislators are not middle management. We're a co-equal branch of government, and he hasn't learned that yet. At least that's what this one legislator, and granted that was very much a Democrat, I think Republicans have very much stuck by Rauner and the leaders have, it seems to me, done what they can to echo basically everything that he says and wants. <laughs> but Pat, w was it a mistake for the governor to have allowed his fiscal year 16 budget to go forward without having come to a deal on fiscal year 15 yet because as we've said i mean it seems as if legislators were were really waiting to see what, what's he going to propose sure. but when they saw that it was cut 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 they are less willing to <coughs> give him the power at least democrats are right. and they have the super majority sure. he might have um you know as you kind of alluded to he might have just poisoned the well you know ahead of time you know if you are building up this ill will about your 2016 budget um 
what's to make them think that you're not going to, you know, just slash and burn through the 2015, the remainder of 2015. And, um, you know, if they, if politically, if they were to give him that power to just do whatever he pleases, um, he probably would have to wear the jacket for that. And so they probably would be able to wash their hands of it. But I think there's a lot of people um, and a lot of um, entrenched interests and, um, and people, you know, with, uh, causes that are dear to them that don't want to see that happen just for their own, um, you know, I guess for their own political interests, really. When he continues to ratchet up his union rhetoric mm -hmm. um, and talked again about right to work right. and spoke to actually a farmers group in Springfield this week and hit back at that, what role or what kind of dynamic is changed because of Rauner's stance on unions, do you think? in all of these negotiations. Any? Could it help achieve a budget result? Do Democratic leaders not really care? Is this a side mm -hmm. thing? Well, I think it definitely um, is going to alienate a few Republican lawmakers who have um, strong uh, union um, representation in their districts. Um, people like Rich Brower, um, Representative Rich Brower. From former. This, yeah, well, for, former now. Um, he was moved out of the legislature into a job at IDOT because um, ostensibly, I mean, this is, you know, unofficial and this is just, you know, us reasoning, but um, the uh, kind of the scuttlebutt has been that he probably would have had to vote against, um, you know, Rauner's anti-union um, legislation or whatever he would put forward because, you know, um, so much of Springfield is union representation. Um, and, you know, it's union So you territory. lose a crucial Republican vote. Right. But, of course, they replaced him with somebody, you know, um, really young and who really has, you know, fealty to the governor because, um, you know, look who uh, put me in this position. I'm going to do whatever he wants. Well, that was for Representative Wayne Rose. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, We're still yeah. waiting for the replacement right. for Broward. Right. But I do think that that brings about a very interesting issue for Rauner in the long term mm -hmm. because if you do take out some of these uh, Republicans who are allied with labor or maybe are seen as more moderates, mm -hmm. who are you going to replace them with? I mean, the district is the district. Yeah. And so you're going to, regardless, have a lot of Springfield residents who work for state government and are therefore members of unions, at least as it stands now, unless Rauner gets uh, his fair share contract and a whole lot more pretty soon. I mean, does that open a whole lot of opportunities then for Democrats to strengthen their super majorities because you have Republicans taking positions that their predecessor wouldn't have gone along sure. with because they would feel that they were going to get voted out? Yeah, anytime you, you put someone with a you know, more extreme view, um, and I'm using extreme here not as a, a denigrating term, but you know, further from the center, of course. Um, anytime you have someone with you know, a, a belief that's further from the center, you kind of make it either um, more difficult to defend that spot you know, if, they're, um, let, if their district is you know, more centrist right. or, or the other party, or really easy to defend that spot if their district is, you know. Um, is matching. Is, exactly, exactly. So um, in the case of, um, you know, Rosenthal's district or, or Brower's district, um, both of those are, you know, mostly Republican but also union oriented. And so you have to find the right person to fit that, um, that uh, kind of profile but still be willing to vote the way you want them to vote. Right. Well, as we continue our budget talk here, we've heard again from the House Speaker, Michael Madigan. He came right out of the budget address saying that he believed Illinois could not just cut its way out of the terrible financial situation that it's in, needed more revenue, and he had a suggestion for that a tax on income above a million dollars. So that would be an extra 3% for those of you who are lucky enough to be at that pay grade. <laughs> that was something that he had put before voters in November in a non-binding referendum question. And overwhelmingly, I believe it was 64% of voters said, yeah, we're for it. That would, however, require changing the state constitution. So what does that mean for this year's budget? And Andy, does this have a chance of passing? Or if not, why is the speaker continuing to talk about it? He couldn't get it through last time. Why now? Uh, well, now he has exactly what you alluded to at the 64%. He sort of has what I think a lot of people might consider a popular mandate. Um, it's also something that just sort of on the optics polls well with folks. If you want to say, where are we going to get the money? We're going to get it from the people who already have it. 
Um, that's a very popular sentiment. It always has. It's especially gained traction uh, in the last few years. For budget negotiations now, uh, doesn't mean a whole lot because we wouldn't see this happen until after the 2016 election. By the time it would have a chance to pass through the legislature and pass uh, a, a popular vote during the 2016 ele uh, elections. Uh, but uh, you could say that it, it doesn't have a tangible effect for now. What it does is while Senate President Cullerton is saying, you know, we have no deal, we're not close to a deal on this current budget, you have the speaker really not being as vocal about it, but in the same week putting forth the millionaire tax, which during the election year obviously and still uh, seems to be pointed pretty directly at somebody like Bruce Rauner. And especially <laughs> because the money would go towards schools and Rauner wants to be the education governor. You know, we this comes as we've had some municipal elections and what's drawn a lot of attention is the city of Chicago's elections in part because obviously it's the state's largest city, but also because current Chicago mayor Rahm Emanuel is buds with Bruce Rauner. They're good friends, vacation together, have business ties, and Rauner, I'm sorry, pardon me, um, Rahm Emanuel is facing a runoff election from a very pro-union, union-backed candidate. This is unexpected, really a first time for the city of Chicago. Rahm Emanuel, of course, is a huge name nationally. He had been chief of staff to the president of the United States. Barack Obama had come to Chicago to campaign on his behalf and try and really turn up particularly the black vote, and it didn't work. What does this mean, if anything, any lessons for Bruce Rauner, particularly as I know I'd seen uh, comments about Rahm Emanuel has been too much of a wine and cheese mayor and Chicago likes its beers and brats. And is that maybe a lesson that Rauner needs to learn as well? Uh, it's an interesting question. I don't know much about beers and brats versus wine and cheese, but... I know a lot uh, about all the <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but New yeah, show. <laughs> it, it's an interesting question as, as to, you know, what sort of practical effect this has on, on state government. If, if Rahm ends up not being reelected and losing the runoff, um, we haven't really had a lot of chance to see how their friendship would sort of permeate mm -hmm. uh, the elected office. Um, already, though, uh, Governor Rauner's budget I slashed would propose to slash hundreds of millions from the CTA and Chicago Teachers Fund and, and uh, the mayor's office has, has already come out yeah. and sort of blasted that. Now part of you wonders is this some sort of just you know public sort of song and dance and are they just gonna go back behind closed doors and say yeah well you know this is what we're gonna do for real. Um, it's hard to say. Uh, it does seem apparent though that um, they have some similarities publicly. They, they've cast themselves as sort of these uh, uh, officials who are willing to kind of talk tough and they're not afraid to make enemies and make the tough decisions. Uh, Is both face huge budgetary Both face huge budget problems, and right. pension problems. Uh, but it, it's hard to really, I think, put your thumb on, on what this means if Emanuel doesn't get elected. Now, go ahead. Well, no, you. Yeah. I was just going to say, it's, it, we're still a ways from that because we still right. have the runoff. April 7th. You would, sure. you would think that, that the incumbent Mayor Emanuel is still the favorite. Uh, although I haven't seen much handicapping on that yet, but um, you know, we kind of have to see how, how that plays out. Well, I think that it's interesting to watch for really two reasons. First of all, there is what will it mean for the state and its finances? So will Rauner go ahead and make cuts that hurt the city of Chicago as his buddy is trying to lead it out of its own financial mess? But also, it seems as if Rahm and Rauner, I keep on mixing their names up, they, <laughs> they have a lot of similarities. As you noted, the, the tough decisions, it, Rauner has clearly come out very much, he says he's not anti-union, but unions sure as heck see it that way. And Rahm Emanuel, likewise, has caused a lot of consternation, particularly with the Chicago Teachers Union. Karen Lewis, before she had brain cancer, was going to run against him after he had closed a bunch of Chicago schools. Teachers unions aren't happy with him. Are there lessons for Bruce Rauner politically as he's on the mm -hmm. beginning of this trajectory and Rahm Emanuel has most certainly hit a very big stumble? I would say definitely um, that Rauner can probably learn um, 
to hedge his bets a little bit in terms of his rhetoric. Um, if he's going to have to work with a Chicago mayor who, like you said, is pro um, pro union and union backed, um, you know, historically the um, the Chicago mayor's office has wielded a lot of influence in the state house. You know, not necessarily direct influence because he doesn't have you know a statutorial um, a statutory um, role there, but um, he has a lot of lobbyists there. You know, um, and the interests of Chicago, of course, are on a lot of legislators' minds because there's a lot of Chicago lawmakers there. Um, and if the governor, like you know, we've said before, poisons that well, um, he there's a lot of things that a Chicago mayor can do to make the road tougher for a governor. You know, even if it's just um, kind of aligning the Chicago lawmakers against against him, you know, or or playing some other issue um, against him in order to get what what the the mayor wants. You know, so there's a lot of um, indirect ways that a um, and an adversarial Chicago mayor can cause headaches for the governor if you know if they don't work together. Well we've had Standard and Poor's come out with a report that said no we're not giving any sort of credit rating downgrade to the city of Chicago but it is keeping a very keen eye on what is happening with the election situation it says that the runoff could lead to problems as Rahm Emanuel has tried to continue something else that really ticks off unions as he seeks to cut back their pension benefits. So uh, there has been, of course, we're all waiting for state pension benefits to have its day in court. That's coming up March 11th. A lot of anticipation. What is the Supreme Court going to do with that? We have had, however, some news getting back to the city of Chicago and kind of its role with the state, right, Andy? Right. They, there was a, a suit alleging that the subsidized or free health care for uh, some of the Chicago employees also violated that same pensions clause that's in the state constitution, right, because it incorporates members of not only the state pension systems but also the municipalities. Uh, so when the city of Chicago didn't reauthorize an ordinance that was passed, I believe, in 2003, uh, these employees filed suit alleging taking this away from us is a violation of the, the, the state constitution and the pensions clause. The federal seventh circuit, which is the appeals court in the, in the federal court level, uh, came down with the decision yesterday um, saying that, uh, well, they're going to leave it to the Illinois Supreme Court to figure out exactly the scope of the pension clause. Um, so in practical terms, we're still waiting uh, uh, for March 11th and beyond to see how exactly that uh, that legal issue plays out. If it was possible to put any more kind of weight on that Supreme Court right. decision, right. we have even more We have more some now. more of it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And it, I, it, as we had mentioned, credit ratings agencies, Moody's came out with a statement regarding Illinois' pension situation. We're kind of circling back here to the state budget and Moody's thoughts on Governor Bruce Rauner's plans. Uh, yeah, they uh, came out and acknowledged that a lot of his budget plan would be very difficult uh, to implement, especially with the Democratic legislature. Um, uh, the, the pension savings, $2.2 .2 billion, uh, they've cited as being perhaps not uh, doable with the legislature and the Constitution the way it is. So. Um, they're at least taking stock of, of, of that and uh, uh, what it could mean uh, going forward. And who knows whether or not that came up at Rauner's calling a cabinet meeting. Mm -hmm. he, the governor himself was only there for about 10 minutes. I mean, he talked. He spent the whole time saying, I'm here for you. It's okay. Point your arrows at me. I know it's hard to deal, to lead an agency when you're low on resources, but we're going to get there eventually. Not going to be a happy feet year. And then he walked out. So who knows what he, what he said thereafter. Pat, is there anything that we should take away? Is it a good sign that a governor held this sort of cabinet meeting? Or who cares? Again, was that more for a press pop than anything? Uh, I, I have to probably default to it was just keeping up appearances. You know, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm making the effort to, to show you that I'm, you know, that I care about your plight. I'm making the effort. Yeah, that I'm, yeah, that exactly, that I'm making the effort, that I care about your plight, and, you know, that we're all in this together. But then he, you know, leaves, and they, they're the ones that have to deal with the, um, you know, the situation. And uh, m almost every state agency has been cut, 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 cut over the past, uh, I don't even know how long, but it's been a long series of cuts over the past few years. And, um, you know, they all say, well, we're doing less, or we're doing, we're doing more with less, you know, each year. And um, while, you know, you can 
you can cut a lot of things that are non-essential services. Those non-essential services um, do have long-term um, consequences if you cut them. And a lot of areas where people say that cuts now are going to cause deeper fiscal right. problems down the road. Before we go on, I want to make sure and touch on Exelon has come out with its long-awaited plan for it has warned we're going to have to close half of our nuclear fleet. They're losing money. They want a state solution. Exelon is very powerful, let me tell you. They are an <laughs> energy company, but very much so a power company. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Pat, what is this legislation do and how does that run um, perhaps at ahead with another energy effort that is really being pushed by environmentalists and the renewables industry? Uh, um, uh, I'll give a little bit of background. I think I'll, I'll let Andy handle the, the legislation because I'm, I'm more the background guy on this. So there's a few things to note. Um, Illinois is a net exporter of energy um, and so basically we make more energy than we need. Um, but nukes are, you know, nuclear power plants are not as competitive here because of uh, the way our, our market is structured, people can choose where they buy their, their electricity the from. Exactly, exactly. And so coal is still the cheapest, um, um, cheapest option, and so most people go with coal, but um, coal plants are closing because of new environmental regulations. And so that's kind of the, the backdrop of, um, of what's going on here, and that's kind of why the nukes are, um, at least in Exelon's um, uh, you know, literature, are unprofitable, but even the uh, Illinois Commerce Commission, which sets the prices for power, um, basically has said we can't really tell whether they're unprofitable or not. They came out with a report in January that said, you know, we just we're not really sure. So it's really hard to say. Yeah. Is this Exelon really? It says it, we need in order to maintain this reliable, right. inexpensive, and low carbon emitting uh, powerhouse. Mm -hmm. We need. And a little bit of extra money because we're not going to keep on, we're, we're a company. Yeah. We can't have things that are operating at a loss, but we're not really quite able to tell that. And clearly, Exelon is not needing for cash. They yeah. have a whole, <laughs> they have a huge, huge, huge profit. Um, so well, I think this is going to be something that we're going to see play out very much at the Capitol this mm -hmm. year, right? Definitely, definitely. Um, and the this I think you alluded to the smart grid thing uh, before, uh, basically an, um, an initiative to get um, Basically, smarter meters in everyone's houses, so, uh, so that they can tell, you know, when. Um, how it's uh, going? Out, how much energy you're using? Right, exactly. Basically, to make the grid more efficient, to make it um, more robust, um, to make it eas more easily fixable, um, all those things. And um, there's been a lot of um, back and forth over whether that's right. needed, whether that's uh, helpful, whether we the state should pay for it or whether they should pay for it themselves. For consumers, right now, yeah. there's a separate rate charge, and that is actually uh, an extension of this rate formula that has customers paying for the smart grid updates is the very first bill that is on Governor Bruce Rauner's desk. <laughs> Plenty of more Power Chat will be ahead on future Capital View episodes, but for this week, I would like to very much thank Pat Yeagle of the Illinois Times for joining us. Also, Andy Maloney of the Chicago Daily Law Bulletin. I'm Amanda Vinicky with WUIS and Illinois Public Radio. Check us out on Facebook, pardon me, at Capital View Politics.